Hi, this is Pastor Stephen Feinstein again. And so now I'm ready to move on to a different book. As a lot of you guys know, I've been making these um, videos where I'm taking various books from my personal library that I have not read before, and <clears throat> I'm reading through them and summarizing their content. In a sense, what you're getting out of this is, is good, sound theology that's derived from the scripture, but is being brought to us by gifted scholars who've written uh, books on these subjects to help us learn more about the Word of God. And so I finished Al Mohler's book, He Is Not Silent, which really told us about how to worship God through the preaching of the Word. Now we're moving on to a book put out by Nine Marks called Biblical Theology in the Life of the Church, written by Michael Lawrence. I'm picking books that are directed towards life in the church. So that's why I talked a lot about preaching and studying the word with the last book. Now with this book, uh, we're going to be talking about how to read the Bible. Because let's be real, most people who say they are Christians do not know how to read the Bible properly. Or they, they just don't. They don't read the Bible properly. They read the Bible as if it's an answer book or as if it's a, a bunch of moral platitudes. But they don't read the Bible for what it is. And so <clears throat> this is a book on biblical theology. So my goal is to read 50 pages of the book and then summarize that in each video. This is a dense book in terms of the content. I can't cover all the details in these short videos, um, but hopefully what this does is gives you, gives you enough information to where you either want to learn more and so you could get the book, or it g equips you to the point to where you could at least read the Bible better. Because look, as Christians, we grow by the Word of God, and if we don't need, know how to read it properly, we're not going to grow like we should. And so I think this is a, is a good book to go over. And so uh, pretty much starting out with this is think about it this way. Okay, let's say you have a friend who's an unemployed Christian, and somebody told him to look up Deuteronomy chapter 28, which more or less says your barns will be full. And so he's looking at this and he says, well, the Bible promises if my faith is big enough, God's going to hook me up financially. Let's say one of his, his friends told him that. He opens up to Deuteronomy 28, he reads it with his own eyes, and now he's asking you about it. Is that a proper interpretation? How do you know if you're going to answer yes or no? Well, really it comes down to, do you read the Bible right? It's all very important. Okay, and so as brothers and sisters in Christ, we're supposed to counsel each other. We're supposed to, to preach God's word to each other. And yet, if we don't know what the Bible actually says and what the Bible actually means and how to read the Bible properly, then chances are you're going to misapply the word to people. Most people watching this have never read the Bible cover to cover. That's a big problem right there. And then when I add to that the fact that most people watching this might spend a few minutes a day in the Bible but spend hours on TV, hours listening to secular music, hours reading literature from the world, whether it's the newspaper or magazines, most of what you are receiving, most of what you are intaking is not the Word of God. And so if somebody asks you a very important question about their life, chances are you're going to give them an answer based off of your instinct or what you naturally know. And what you naturally know is coming far more from the world than from the Word of God. Okay, And so the way we could remedy that is not only by reading the Bible every day, and, and reading all of the Bible over the course of a year, but also learning how to study the Bible and how to, to learn it properly. And so that's what this book's all about. Now first, let me just ask and answer the question, what is the Bible, right? Some people think this is just an answer book. It's not. Other people think it's just a narrative. It's just a story about how God is saving people. And it's not just that. Now listen, the Bible does have answers and it does give us wisdom. And it is a story of how God is acting within history to save a people for himself, for his own glory. That's all true, but you can't say the Bible's only those things. It's so much more, okay? It is God's written word, his divine revelation given to us so that we, it's the final rule of an authority for our lives so that we can know God, know true truth about God, and at the same time, live accordingly and walk in a way that's pleasing to God. That's one thing the Bible does, but it is a story of God's redemptive work and how we fit into that story. 
And, and so there's just so much to that. There's so many implications. And so the Bible is given to us in such a way that it allows for systematic answers to any question we may have about life and faith and pleasing God. You know, when, when that unemployed brother asks, hey, if I'm faithful, isn't God going to give me a job? Isn't that guaranteed? The Bible has a systematic, well-thought-out answer for that. And so the question is, how do you read the scriptures to be able to, to give that answer, right? So we have to understand what the Bible teaches in, a con, in the context of what is called progressive revelation. And so let me, let me talk a little bit about this. The Bible is divine revelation. It comes to us from God, right? But there's four characteristics you need to know about it if you're going to read it correctly. First, it's progressive. And what I mean by that is if you compare this to Islam, right, supposedly the Quran was written all at once. It was all given to Muhammad at one time. Or if you look at the, the supposed writings of, of Buddhism, their sacred text, it all comes down to the lifetime of Siddhartha Gautama, the original Buddhist, right? But when you're dealing with the scripture, it wasn't written in the lifetime of a single person. The Bible was written over a period of 1,400 years. It was written on three different continents by over 40 different authors from multiple walks of life and in three different languages. And it's not just one book, it's 66 books. And yet these books make up a comprehensive, coherent story. So given that it's progressive, what I mean is that it starts off with the beginning and it grows. Starts with Genesis and grows and grows and grows and grows until we end up with all 66 books. And so because of that, where you open up to in the Bible, this is, what you're reading comes at a certain point in time of progressive revelation of when this particular text was revealed. That's important to know. For example, Psalm 118 was written long before the Gospel of Matthew was written. So you have to know that and you have to understand the implications of that. Second characteristic is it's historical. The Bible is not a book of fairy tales. It's historical. It records things that happened in real history. It talks about real people, real places, real cultures, real cities, real wars. Uh, and, and really, it's more than just a human story. It's God's story within history, right? You have, the, you have it start off with creation, and it tells us it's going to end with a new creation. And in between that, you have the history of the fall of man and God's work within history to save and redeem those who have fallen. Okay, So it is historical. It's progressive. And then third, it's organic. And, and what I mean by that, as it starts off as a seed, but it grows, right? It grows into, starts off as the first five books, but then grows into the 66 books. So for example, you start to see a little bit about the Savior in Genesis chapter 3. But then that seed grows as more is revealed. This seed is also going to be a king descended from the tribe of Judah, who himself is descended from the patriarch Abraham, right? And then specifically, as it goes on more, he's going to be a descendant of King David. And as it tells us more, he's going to be born of a virgin, and he's going to be more than just a man. He's going to be the God-man, right? So it starts off as a seed and then naturally grows. And that's true with all the doctrines you find in the scripture, Okay, so that's what I mean when I say it's organic. So it's progressive, it's historical, it's organic, and then finally it's practical, right? This isn't just a story that you listen to and then say, oh, this is the real account of God saving a people for himself, and that means you're part of the story. Because if the Bible story itself, which is real history, is creation and new creation, and in between the fall of man and God's work to redeem man, you're in that middle portion. And then within that middle portion, there's multiple acts. And the fact is, you are actually a big part of God's story, and you have a big role to play. And so knowing where you fit in God's story, what part you're in, and God's massive meta-narrative, as I mentioned um, in one of the previous videos, knowing where you are at in that is very important. That's how you won't misinterpret and misapply Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28 comes at a point of time in progressive revelation that is not talking about you. 
Okay, It's talking about a specific thing God was doing with the nation of Israel as he was bringing them into the land. You are part of the church, a people of every nation, tribe, and tongue being added to Israel with a mission to go declare God's gospel to the world. Right, And so some of the promises are different. Uh, Just the, the very way that God is interacting with us and dealing with us is different. Right, And so you have to know the whole storyline to understand that. And because you are part of this story of God redeeming mankind, everything this says applies to you in some way, either directly or in principle. And so you have to figure out how to apply each and every text. Now, five things about the Bible in addition to those four characteristics is the Bible is human. When people say the Bible was written by men, that's true. God used over 40 different human authors. He used their their vocabulary patterns, the cultures they were raised in, the history that they come from. All that's there, right? It's not like God dictated what each of them was going to write. He came upon them, but it was still them writing it. Okay, so it is a human book with a distinctly human characteristic. And as a result, you do have to understand the, the human history behind each given book of the Bible. But it's not just human. The Bible is also divine. 2 Timothy 3.16 makes it clear that it's breathed out by God. 1 Peter chapter 1, I believe starting at verse 22, says the Holy Spirit moved along the people who wrote the scriptures and had them write what He wanted them to write. Now, it wasn't through dictation. He's using their thought patterns, their vocabulary, but he's having them record the truth that he is teaching them. He's having them record that truth without error. So at the same time, it's a word written by men. It's also the word of God. So any text you read from the scripture is the very word of God. Okay. So in that sense, it's authoritative. Okay, but to understand what God's saying, we also have to understand what he was doing with the human that was writing it. So you have to understand both the human and the divine side of it. The scripture also, third, the Bible's a meta narrative. It's a story. Okay, as I said, it's got its main acts. You have creation, new creation, and a lot of stuff happening between. Where do you fit within that? Where does each book fit within that act? Another thing you need to understand is the Bible is structured through covenants. It's where God uh, more or less says, you will be my people, okay? And then he sets stipulations, what he's going to do, what we're supposed to do, right? And uh, God's covenant with us ultimately is a covenant of grace. But even apart from from God's gracious covenant to, to be our God and to let us be his people, Within the storyline of scripture, we see God deal with people in various covenants. The covenant with Noah, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with Moses, the covenant with David, the new covenant, right? That, that's all important. So, for example, that Deuteronomy 28 falls under the covenant with Moses, which was specific to Israel. It's not specific to those who are part of the church, right? We are under the new covenant. That's why it's inappropriate to take a passage from the old covenant and apply it in a normative way to somebody in the new covenant. Now, there are principles from that old covenant that definitely apply, okay? But but the actual detail of the command wouldn't. So understanding that the Bible is structured through covenants is very important. And then finally, you got to understand what is the center of the scripture. Now, this is debated. And, and what I'll tell you is Michael Lawrence in this book argues that the center, the very thing that unifies all 66 books, is the glory of God through salvation by judgment. The glory of God through salvation by judgment. Meaning every text of the scripture, somehow, every verse is playing into that, that unifying theme. That God is glorifying himself by saving a people for himself, but he saves those people through judgment. Specifically the judgment of Christ, our Messiah, in our place. Every text therefore can make a beeline to the cross, a beeline to the gospel. Every text written before the cross is pointing to it. Every verse of the Bible written after the cross is pointing back to it. But that is the focal and center point of it all. So as I said, this is a book about biblical theology. Biblical theology is central to the church. And if you want to know what biblical theology is then, now that we know what the Bible is, biblical theology is seeking the theme that unites these 66 books into one big story. 
It's not 66 independent stories that contradict each other. No, it's one meta narrative. Okay, so biblical theology seeks to find that theme, that scarlet thread, as some call it, that run from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And so every time you open the text, you have to have that in your mind. You have to be thinking about that, right? And so then the last thing I'll talk about, because I know this is this is hefty, and this is really still just an introduction, even though it's the first 50 pages. When you're going to do biblical theology, you have to know how to read a text, right? And so the technical term is exegesis. Now, there's levels of exegesis. Um, exegesis is where you extract out from the text. What does the text mean? Every time you guys read a newspaper, an internet, internet article, an email, you do this. Because it's written to you within your own cultural frame, and so you're able to understand what people are saying. For the most part, you interpret what they said, and, and then you, you go forth from there. Well, same thing with the Bible. The difference is the Bible was written a long time ago from a culture very different from ours. So in that sense, it means you have to do a little bit of homework and, and extra thinking when you are reading it. And that's, that's the, the work of exegesis. Now, some will say because it was written so long ago in a different culture, in a different language, you can't understand it. That's not true. Human nature is human nature. They have the same nature, same struggles that we have, right? And so because of that, we could relate to every word in this and we could understand it. it just means we have to do our homework. So proper ex exegesis is done through what's called the historical grammatical method, which means first you take the grammar of the text. When you're reading a particular text of scripture, you have to ask, what does this sentence mean? Okay. A lot of times people focus too much on word studies, but listen, you don't know what words mean until you know what the sentence means. For example, I could say the word ball. What does that mean? Well, you don't know what I mean by ball. I could either mean a spherical object, I can mean a basketball, a football, or I can mean a dance that Cinderella went to, right? You have no idea what I mean until I give you a sentence. When I say, if I say, well, people were disappointed because Cinderella didn't show up to the ball, now you know what I mean. Okay, so the whole sentence put together is what lets you know what the word means. That's called syntax. And so when, when you're interpreting scripture, when you're reading it, you have to ask, what does each sentence mean? And then sometimes to understand what each sentence means, you have to figure out what the paragraph means. So you start with the paragraph, you go down to the sentence, and then you go down to specific words if a word requires extra study. So when you're reading the Bible... You look for the context, you look for the, you know, if I'm reading the, the, the book of Romans and I'm in chapter 3, I need to understand what chapter 3 is saying as a whole. And then I realize it's coming off of chapter 2 and it's coming off of chapter 1. And, and I start to realize the whole point Paul's making is humanity is universally sinful. And so then when I get to the second half of Romans 3, I understand in light of that what he's saying. Jesus Christ had to die on the cross in our place as our substitute and raised from the dead, that way God could still be just by punishing our sin, but on Christ, but he could be the one who justifies sinners because Christ took our, our place, right? And so what I did there is I did a, a basic exegesis by looking at the big picture that surrounded that text and then understanding what each sentence means and each paragraph and ultimately each word. When you read the Bible carefully, you could do that. So that's the grammatical side. Uh, the historical side for the historical grammatical uh, method is to remember like, what's the historical background? Who wrote this? Why did they write this? Any good study Bible has all that information for you. You don't have to have all these commentaries behind you like I have. That helps when you need to go deeper, especially if you're going to preach the word. But if you're just trying to read it to understand it so that you can live in accordance with it and, and help other people out, then a good study Bible is plenty to give you the basic historical background that you need, right? So the historical grammatical method. So you pay attention to the grammar, you pay attention to the history so that surrounds that book, and then finally... You have to pay attention to where this text fits in the meta narrative. Okay, so for example, Romans 3 is written after the cross, after people have been redeemed by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so then you understand what Paul is doing there is he's making an argument telling you exactly what was accomplished on the cross and why it needed to happen, right? So that again lets me place it within its proper place in the whole scripture, right? Whereas I could look back at Deuteronomy.
and say, well, this was actually um, 1,400 years before the cross. And, and what God was doing is he's setting the people of Israel up in the land and telling them how he's going to bless them in the land if they obey, because God's plan is to bring forth kings and eventually the king of kings from this people Israel that he's bringing in the land. So then I realized, wait, Deuteronomy 28 really doesn't have much to do with me right now, other than I need to be obedient to God. But Romans 3 has everything to do with where I'm located in, in, you know, in God's story right now. So hopefully that all makes sense. Um, when you're going to do your exegesis, you have to understand that not every book of the Bible is the same genre. So like the Gospels are narratives, they're history. You're going to learn to look for different things in a narrative than, let's say, from a letter. When Paul's writing a letter, you're just looking at what each paragraph is saying. That's how you figure out what it means. When you're looking at poetry, you're going to look for parallelism, that you have two lines usually, and the second line is going to tell you something uh, more about the first line usually. When you're dealing with prophecy, you got to understand what was the role of the prophet, then you understand what the prophet's doing. When you're looking at apocalypse like Revelation or Daniel, you have to understand the rules of that writing so that you don't misinterpret it. And so what I'm saying is there's good resources out there that could give you the basics on all the different genres. That way, when you're reading the Bible, you could do the proper exegesis by understanding what the, the sentences and paragraphs and words mean, what it's telling you, where it fits in the big story of everything, and what it requires of you. And then you're able to rightly counsel others. And so my prayer is, as we go through this more and more, you will learn more and more about how to read the Bible correctly. This is more or less just telling you the what with only a little bit of the how, but we'll get into the, the how and, and even more of the what as, as we go on. As I said, this book is dense. It has a lot of good stuff, but listen, this title says it all. Biblical Theology in the Life of the Church. Okay, the church should not be people coming together hearing little sermonettes that are just moral platitudes to help you live an easier life. No, it's all about the grand story of scripture. How does this play in your life? How does this play in the church's life? And how are we constantly encouraging each other and teaching each other and counseling each other and stirring one another up in line with God's narrative of him redeeming us for his glory? right? If this is not entrenched in the DNA of the church, then it's not a good church, okay? And so that's why it's very important we continue on with a study like this and understand this is what, uh, this is how it's supposed to be.